Kanisha. So who's your favourite South Park character? I always used to like Kenny, because you couldn't understand what he was saying. I do like Kenny. Kenny's pretty cool. <laughs> South Park is a rare example of an animated show that somehow managed to stay relevant and fresh 20 years after its original inception. A feat we feel should be credited, at least partially, to the fact that neither creator of the show seems to give a single solitary fuck. Before we get into that, I'd like to mention it's amazing how South Park managed to come up with like episodes that are almost in real time, like events that happened literally weeks ago. Yes, like they all respond to things like that happen the week that the show airs, and that has something to do with the fact that every episode of South Park is written, animated, voiced, and finalised in just six days. That is insane. It is, and it has been for almost the show's entire creative run. And every episode takes them just under a week to film, except for, oddly enough, the very first episode they did, which they filmed with construction paper. So people don't know, like, they actually did the very first episode, I believe that is the Cartman Gets an Anal Probe, was filmed with the construction paper style, like, you know, basically stop motion with construction paper, whereas every subsequent episode was filmed using digital effects. Yeah, which would take a lot less time. Like, if you see, like, a film which is it stop motion, it's months. like, uh, it takes, like, three or four years for a stop motion film. Think of it this way. The first episode, Cartman Gets an Anal Probe, took them six months. They can now film an episode in six days. And I believe uh, they f the digital software they use is the same stuff they use for the snow effects on Frozen. I think, is it Maya? Oh, yeah, Maya. Is that the, yeah, which is apparently super high-end, and they uh, yeah. liken it to using a bulldozer to build a sandcastle. And I think what they did is they used like super high-end computers to scan in every piece of construction paper they had. And then they used that and manipulate it digitally. And it seems like such a weird thing to do. It's entirely unique to them and does allow them to basically respond to real world events in real time. The best example I think has to be, I forget the name of the episode now, but it's the one that's about um, the election of Barack Obama that went up the day after the election and not only featured snippets of Obama's actual speech, but also featured a recreation of the crowd behind Obama during his speech, realizing the South Park style. And presumably there'll be like side by side, just clips showing now. More than 200 years after a former colony won the right to determine its own destiny, I assure you all, I am heading back to the White House more motivated, more titillated than ever. Uh, and have you seen that at all? No, but I need to see it. Okay, because like the laptop's been making a lot of appearances in video, so fuck it, you can do Oh God, look at that, touch screen, baby. Hell yeah, so yeah. <laughs> they recreate the entire crowd. It's like perfect. Yeah, one to one. And I believe what they did is they wrote two episodes, one if Barack Obama won and one if, I forget who even was his opponent that election, was it? Romney, was it? Mitt Romney, yeah. Mitt, yeah, and one if Romney won. So like, they basically had two episodes ready to go and they just slotted in whoever won into the story. But the fact they even managed to get everybody in the crowd. The other one that they did is they managed to predict an event ahead of time, like with the recent China story, which we have to talk about because that was amazing. Well, they released an episode that was about um, Chinese censorship of like, you know, Western media. Yeah. But they released it before like two huge, massive stories about Chinese censorship broke. And one of them was Blizzard, because on a stream of a competition that this guy won, he said free Hong Kong, and Blizzard, in response, took away his winnings and banned him from playing the game for like a year. Like, he won, yeah. and they took away his winnings. This was a massive global story. And um, obviously, they predicted that ahead of time, because the episode of South Park went out before this happened. And then another one was an NBA player said something similar, while other NBA players were in China about to put on like a game for a Chinese crowd and the game was canceled and pulled within like a day. In the episode, which remember aired before this story broke, you can see as Randy's on a plane to China, um, in the background you see people from the NBA. <laughs> so like they, they apparently knew ahead of time it was gonna happen. He had still with the NBA, doing some press with the players to try to get more Chinese viewers. Oh, for Christ's sake. Wasn't the same thing with The Simpsons as well? They only like predict something like 10 years. Simpsons has predicted a lot, but um, I think that's mostly because they've been on the air for so long. Like they predicted yeah. like President Trump yeah, in one yeah, episode yeah. where Lisa goes into the future. And they even predict that he'd be shit at being president. Because they say we've got a huge budget deficit because of President Trump. But we can use Simpsons as an example of like, you know, another like animated show that's been on the air for a long time. Simpsons takes about six months to make an episode. And that's why South Park can release episodes that are relevant to 
pop culture, because I think it's fair to say that pop culture moves so fast these days. It's like memes. If you put a meme in an episode of The Simpsons, it'll be out of date by the episode airs. Like South Park can kind of get away with that. There's also a lot of little things they do, despite the fact they make an episode in six days, I really appreciate. And like you said, your favourite character is Kenny. Yeah. And Kenny's obviously he's, he's poorer than the other kids. There's a few little details you'll notice if you watch the show, such as like when they're writing, um, everyone will use a pen and Kenny will use a pencil. Yeah. Pencils are cheaper. Or when they're like at the cinema or they're like out having a meal, Kenny will have a smaller meal and I'll drink water because water's free. Did you ever have that PlayStation 1 game South Park Rally? No, but I had the first person shooter where you had like the chicken cannon and the alien ray gun that made people dance. So I was really into the racing games when I was younger. I had pretty much every every sort of kid racing game in South Park was one of them. It's, I, I which one was the best? If you discount all the famous ones, what would you say is like, you know, a connoisseur of the shitty PS1 racing game was the best cash in like kart racer? I really liked the Toy Story Racer one. That was a PS1 game as was well. Was that good? I, I, I enjoyed it. I don't know if it was considered good in general, but I was, I always played it when I was younger, so. There's people in the comments right now going, oh my god, that game's so hype. Like, they're inviting, you're gonna get invited to tournaments for it or something like that. I think I put a tweet out actually not long ago saying, I've just remembered Toy Story Racer exists. And people are like, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> So many like, old games from that era of game that people always forget about. I think we made a few videos about like um, Nightmare Creatures is one I always bring up for Rau. <laughs> then you have like Wipeout and stuff like that, which is like, it died such a hard death. And that was the game they used to sell the PlayStation because it was graphically so impressive because like compared to like the N64 at the time. Okay, bringing it back to South Park. Mm -hmm. It's the same two guys, isn't it, that for 20 years they've made yeah, it? Yeah, it's uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, and they have been the lead creative force behind the show for its entire run, and they will likely remain in charge for the foreseeable future. And one of the reasons that the show is able to cut so close to the bone in terms of like, you know, the stuff they reference and the jokes they make is because Comedy Central have largely given them a blank check to talk about whatever the fuck they want. And I think the only notable exception is the time they were going to show Muhammad in an episode. And um, Comedy Central said, look, we can't have this. We're getting, we're getting too much heat from the press, but we will let you censor it yourselves. Because I think that's what Matt and Trey, they said, well, okay, we'll cut it, but only if we do it ourselves. Yeah. And that's why in that episode, when Mohammed's about to enter frame, they cut to a black screen, the most obnoxious manner possible, and call Comedy Central a bunch of pussies. And I believe that both Matt and Trey have said, we deeply regret doing that. We'd have rather taken the show off the air than censor ourselves in that manner. And after that happened, they have made it known to Comedy Central, we will not cut anything ever again. Which has apparently not been an issue because they've never managed to put something into an episode that Comedy Central had taken exception to, which we'll talk about in a moment. But to bring it back to that Mohammed controversy, did you know that he'd already been in an episode before? I'm gonna guess he was in the background or something like that. He was in the background, I think, of every introduction from one season up until like season 10 or something like that. But no, he was a central character in the Super Friends episode. Do you remember the Super Friends one where it's like Jesus and uh, Buddha and Mohammed and he's yeah. got the power of flame? And he appears on camera. So it's fine then? Yeah, he appeared on camera completely uncensored and he's got the power of fire and no one complained when it happened. So it was the political climate at the time, I think the Charlie Hebdo attacks had got everybody really, really like on edge uh, about okay. doing that, but it's just kind of amusing that you can, I think that episode has never aired uncensored ever, but you can still go watch the one where Mohammed is a central character and he fires like flames from his fingertips, which is just an interesting tidbit for people. Okay, so they keep trying to push Comedy Central basically. And they're essentially like goading them, like challenging them to like, you know, cancel the show essentially, and they have never managed to push Comedy Central far enough for that to happen yet. A good example of that will be the episode It Hits the Fan, in which the word shit is said around 200 times, which Matt and Trey said, they have to take exception to this one. This one has to be the one that somebody somewhere is going to complain about because it's so excessive. And they sent it to Comedy Central to review, expecting to get back a laundry list of complaints or changes they had to make. And they were really surprised when they just aired the episode without any issue. <laughs> and Matt and Trey were apparently just dumbfounded that they'd gotten away with it. And that's why they just feel so empowered, so emboldened to just keep pushing the envelope. Because no matter what they seem to do, nobody seems to care. They've admitted in multiple interviews, I think someone asked them, 
oh, um, what would you ever do if South Park got cancelled? And their response was just a very blunt, we've been trying to get cancelled for 20 years. It's like, we're done. And uh, Matt and Trey both have this standing agreement with one another that if the show is ever cancelled, they'll both walk away and just say, and I quote, fuck this. Something I believe has a lot to do with the fact they are worth collectively over half a billion dollars. So it's not like they need the money. They just figured if we're going to keep getting paid to make these, we'll keep making them. And we're going to keep seeing what we can get away with until somebody stops us. And apparently nobody is. And that's a mission they're going to be on for a very long time because the show has been renewed up to 2022. So Nisha, you said your favourite character in South Park is Kenny, correct? Yeah, he's one of them. Is I there just... any reason that you like Kenny? Just... I just like, I liked the fact you couldn't understand what you were saying. Just the... Same as the character in um, King of the Hill. I can't remember his name. Boomhauer. Boom. Yeah, he's like... I love... My girl, the difference between old man and old man and old little... Fucking love King of the Hill so much. Let's talk about, like, you know, just that era of animated shows. Like, there was that, that golden era of adult animation where you had King of the Hill, you had The Simpsons, you had South Park, you had Family Guy when it was good, and then a bit later than that you had like American Dad, which is now like phenomenal. And you can't forget Futurama. Oh yeah, Futurama's, oh God, I forgot, man. My favorite. And just, they were all on the air around the same time. And it's like, man, there was so much good comedy on TV at that period, like just specifically animated. And yeah. like, I flip back and forth on which one I actually like the most, because obviously Simpsons is top tier. Like, season 1 to 11 of Simpsons, never is going to be top. That's like, it holds its place, like S tier, comedic excellence right there. But, but second place, that can change depending on what kind of mood I'm in. And sometimes it's Futurama, sometimes it's King of the Hill, sometimes it's American Dad. But they're all fucking good. See, I'm, I'm not really a fan of American Dad. If you watched it when it first aired, like, the show got so much better when they settled into what the characters are. Yeah. And there is one line in one episode that still to this day just makes me crease every time I think about it, and it is Roger and Stan are stuck on a desert island, and they're just sat there, like he's got a big beard, and he's just like, defeated about how to escape, and he just turns and goes, Roger, is there such a thing as a time crab? And it's so random, I just like completely fucking lost it. Roger, I think I figured out a way to get off the island. Is there such a thing as a time crab? And they have like a lot of musical episodes which are just fan-fucking-tastic because Seth MacFarlane very clearly wanted to be a musician more than he wanted to be like, you know, the head of an animated TV show. Because I think both Family Guy and American Dad have a full orchestra just on retainer whenever the fuck they want to use them. So let's focus on that now and stick within the framework of like, you know, animated TV shows of that era and zero in on our favourite musical numbers from them. Because there's a lot, and I'm going to open with the subject of today's video, South Park, and go for the South Park movie, and just say, like, Kyle's mum's a bitch. Like, that song is fucking phenomenal. And I love everything about it. It's so good. I used to have that South Park song. I think it was like, shut your fucking face, motherfucker, uncle fucker. Yeah, shut your it. fucking face, uncle fucker. I Did you have that. the rap remix? No. In the film, they make a brief like allusion to the fact they did a hip hop music video for Shut Your Fucking Face, Uncle Fucker, and they released it on the album. <laughs> and like, we have to give big props to um, the best song on that soundtrack, just in terms of like, you know, it's uh, um, critical success, and that is Blame Canada, which was up for, and I'm shit you not, an Oscar. And it was performed on stage at the Oscars by Robin Williams. And Robin Williams sung Blame Canada at the Oscars. And it lost to, I think we mentioned this in another video, it lost to Phil Collins. And in the pre episode that went up the following week, they have Phil Collins holding his Oscar and they shove it up his ass. Because <laughs> Matt and Trey are anything but petty. But, oh, man, so you got any favourite songs or musical numbers from animated TV shows? I just thought of one, uh, which is at the end of one of the Family Guy episodes, okay. where Brian just, I think he's on stage, I can't remember what episode it is, but Brian's on stage and he's got like a guitar. And he just oh, starts singing Never Gonna the, the Give The Rick Astley one, yeah, that's so good. <laughs> it's just the way he comes up, here's a song by a gay guy. It's like, what? <laughs> here's a song by a gay guy. <laughs> it's just so far pointless fucking introduction to that song. And we have to end with, though, like, one of my favourite animated musical moments, and that has, it's Yakko Warner's. Countries of the world. So it's the Animaniacs, Jacko Warner. It's just a song where they name every single country on earth and it rhymes. And the guy who did the voice, I think it's Rob Paulson, did it in one take and can still do it today. 
United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic, Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too.